Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Welcome to the Myth, Legends and Lore podcast. Today, I have two fantastic tales to share with you, and a little history about a writer I'm sure some of you will know. Lafcadio O'Hearn is perhaps best known for his collection Kwaidan, Stories and Studies of Strange Things. This anthology includes classic Japanese ghost stories and tales of horror, such as the story of Mimi Nashi Huichi and of the snow woman Yuki Ona. Kwaidan is a timeless collection, that is still appreciated in Japan and across the world. It has been a source of inspiration for many a writer, filmmaker, musician and more. It is beautifully written. Hearn communicates a vision of ancient Japan, its mythology, legends and folklore so well that you become lost in the pages of his creation, finding yourself with the desire to learn more and to appreciate what it was that he loved about Japan. Hearn lived a remarkable life. From an early age he travelled, first from Greece to Dublin and Ireland, then, in his teenage years, he relocated from London to America, where he first lived in Cincinnati, before moving to New Orleans. His gift with the written word won recognition. He excelled in the fields of journalism and translation. His first book, based on his experiences in Louisiana, was published in 1885. In 1890, Lafcadio Hearn was on the move once more, this time to Japan. He was at once intrigued and fascinated with the beauty, culture and history of this country and its people. It was in Japan that Heron lived for the rest of his life, working as a professor at the Waseda University as a naturalised citizen, and marrying Setsuko Koizumi, who was descended from samurai, and together raising their four children in Okobo in Tokyo. It is with deep gratitude that we have today the pleasure of enjoying the works of Lafcadio Heron, who brought the myths and legends of Japan to us, allowing generations of readers, students, and lovers of Japanese culture and history a glimpse into another world. I must take a moment to thank my aunt, who first introduced me to Lafcadio O'Hearn, and who has been so encouraging in my pursuit and understanding of Japanese mythology. Thank you, Rikuko. It really has meant so very much. It was Rikuko who also gave me my copy of The Tale of Genji, which I hope to review in a podcast very soon. If you haven't read this book yet, I urge you to give it a try and find a beautifully crafted story of love, betrayal and death at the Imperial Court of Japan in the Heian period, and of course, having the joy of reading Lady Murasaki's great 11th century novel. I must also extend my thanks to Tuttle Publishing, who not only granted me permission to share two tales from the Kwaidan collection with you, but will also be gifting a copy of the book to one lucky listener. My sincere thanks to Anne and Jodie of Tuttle, who were just fantastic. I can assure whoever the winner of the book might be, Lafcadio O'Hearn's Kwaidan is a delight of legend and folklore. The music that you will hear throughout the course of the podcast is from artist Yukuzi and the album Six Days of Snow. As always, I'll provide links in the show description, but you will be able to find this album on Bandcamp. On June 27th, 1850, Patrios Lafcadio's Heron was born in the island of Lefkada in the Ionian Sea. Son to Charles Bush Heron, an army surgeon, who in 1949 had married Rosa Antonio Casimatis, a Greek citizen of Caithirian lineage. After receiving a promotion, Charles Hearn was reassigned to the British West Indies in 1850. He arranged for Rosa and their son to travel to Dublin and live with his family there. However, Charles and Rosa were to become estranged during his absence, with Rosa leaving Lefcadio in the care of his father's aunt, Sarah Brennan, and returning to Greece. Lafcadio never saw his mother again. When Rosa had departed for Greece, she had in fact been pregnant. She gave birth to Daniel James Hearn in 1856. Charles Hearn filed for an annulment, and soon after Rosa remarried. 
Daniel was then sent to live with his father, while Lafcadio remained with Sarah Brennan, and she became his permanent guardian. In 1857, Charles Hearn remarried and accepted a post in India. There was no occasion after this when Lafcadio would see his father again, who died in 1866 as a result of malaria while in the Gulf of Suez. It would appear that education, as well as religion, to which the young Hearn was rather opposed, was at the forefront of Lafcadio's formative years. In fact, Hearn became fluent in French, which would later serve him rather well. At the age of 16, Hearn suffered an injury to his left eye while at school. The damage suffered resulted in complete blindness and discoloration of the iris. In the vast majority of pictures taken after this incident, and said to have felt self-conscious about his appearance, Hearn averted his gaze or opted for a profile shot so as to hide his left eye. There was also an unfortunate period of hardship for the youth when Sarah Brennan fell into financial difficulties. There was little or no money for his continued education. In 1869, at the age of 19, he departed London on a ship bound for the United States of America. After a short period of uncertainty, Hearn gained employment in the printing business before landing the position of a reporter for the Cincinnati Daily Inquirer. In 1874, Hearn married a young mixed-race woman called Althea Foley. Their marriage was in violation of Ohio state laws at that time, and the inquirer decided to fire Hearn from his post despite his success. In response, Hearn went to work for the inquirer's rival newspaper, the Cincinnati Commercial. Sadly, the marriage between Hearn and Foley was not to last. They divorced, and the writer soon found himself in New Orleans, translating into English the works of the French author Gautier, and eventually an editorial position with the New Orleans Times Democrat and Harper's Weekly. In 1887, Harper sent Hearn as a correspondent to the West Indies. He spent two years there and produced two books. Hearn travelled to Japan in the spring of 1890 as a special correspondent for Harper's. Upon arriving, he decided to terminate the contract, but with the help of contacts he had made in New Orleans, Hearn obtained a teaching position at Shimane Prefectorial Middle School in Matsui. Hearn now found himself immersed in Japanese life and living near Izumo, home of mythology and a sacred place of Shinto. While teaching in Matsui, Hearn formed a deep friendship with Nishida Sentaro, the Dean of Professors, who he found to be a kindred spirit. Sadly, Nishida died in 1897. In a book I shall talk about a little in a moment, Hearn's wife, Setsuko Koizumi, recounts how affected her husband was by this passing and that Hearn came home one day after seeing a man from a distance that he was quite sure was his old friend Nishida, and then later how another colleague reminded Hearn of him and taking great consolation in this. It was while Hearn was teaching in Matsui that he was introduced to Setsuku Koizumi by his good friend Nishida. She was the daughter of a prominent samurai family, and in 1896 they were married. Hearn became a naturalised citizen of Japan, and he took the name of Koizumi Yakumo. In a superb article written by Koizumi Bon, he reveals his great-grandfather cheerfully explained in a September letter to his friend Elwood Hendrick. Yakumo is a poetical alternative for Izumo, my beloved province, the place of the issuing of clouds. You will understand how the name was chosen. Together the couple had three sons and one daughter. Throughout the generations of the family, they have kept the name of Lafcadio Hearn, Koizumi Yakumo his writings and his memory alive within Japan and far beyond. It was from his wife, Setsuko, that Hearn originally heard many of the wonderful tales he later told in Kwaidan. In the past, it has been said by critics that Hearn offered the West an exoticised impression of Japan. I tend not to think this of his work at all. Instead, I believe that he lived in a time that was a great period of industrial and social change for a country that he now called home. What Lefkadio Hearn gave us was work of a significant historical value. His great-grandson Koizumi Bon observed this when he wrote in his article. From his Kumamoto days onward, he encountered a Japan that had lost its humility and was pressing forward with westernisation, modernisation and militarism. He had sensed none of these in Matsui. His disappointment brought with it a mature, objective outlook on this country, reducing his fieldwork he shut himself in his study to investigate the Japanese view of Kami. At the same time, he listened to Setsu's ghost tales, becoming engrossed in creating versions imbued with a literary spirit. From 1896 to 1903, 
Hearn taught English literature at the Tokyo Imperial University. Then, in 1904, he became a professor at the prestigious Waseda University. During his life in Japan, he continued to write and publish, including books such as Glimpses of Unfamiliar Japan, Kwaidan, Ghostly Japan, and Japan, an Attempt at Interpretation. In 1904, at only 54 years of age, Lafcadio Hearn died of heart failure. His grave is located in Zoshigaya Cemetery, near Ikebukuro in Tokyo. His epitaph reads, A man of faith, an undefiled flower blooming like eight clouds, who dwells in the mansion of enlightenment. In 1965, Masaki Kobayashi's film Kwaidan was released. It is an anthology of four tales from Lafcadio Hearn, found mainly in the Kwaidan book. It is a stunning piece of cinematic storytelling. Kobayashi's vision of the world in which these tales are brought to life is striking. I would argue that it is not aged very much at all and still offers something to today's audience. Each set was built within a warehouse, allowing Kobayashi to control every aspect of the scenes. The snowstorm is fantastic, as are the battle sequences. The unnerving quality of the tales and how the characters are portrayed is what tends to stay with you long after this film has ended. For me, that is the mark of a wonderful story, whether it concerns ghosts, warriors, maidens, love, portrayal or death. I really do applaud the inspiration Kobayashi took from Heron's work and how he delivered that to the world on screen. The two stories I will share with you today are also in the film. Their roots are to be found in ancient Japanese folk tales. Because of this, one might feel there is another presence other than the ghosts or entities who take centre stage. There is the impression of something timeless, otherworldly and beyond our comprehension. Another wonderful director of visually impressive films is Guillermo de Toro, who not only has a love for the work of Lafcadio O'Hearn, but also that of Misaki Kobayashi. When being interviewed on the Criterion Channel, Del Toro describes his love of Hearn's work when he says, He chronicles Japan for the West. He makes accessible Japanese myth and the richness of their culture, and his fables are full of passion. Of the film, he describes it as an eminently modern movie and as an artefact of ancient roots, because it is based on ancient ghost tales of Japan. And of Yuki Ona, Del Toro describes it as a beautiful paradox of a ghost slash fairy tale. It certainly is that. The film is still available to purchase online, and after hearing it today, you might well find yourself tempted to buy it. The annotated reminiscences of Lafcadio Hearn by Setsuko Koizumi is a remarkable little book. You can almost hear the voice of Setsuko as she recounts her life with her husband and their family. It tells of the love Hearn felt for his family and they for him, the deep and lasting connections he formed with friends and colleagues, his love of nature, the trees and the sea, of a man who enjoyed peace whether at home or in a nearby temple, who could not abide distress in others nor understand those who could let it happen. The tales that Tsuko Koizumi shares are a wonderful glimpse into Lafcadio Hearn's life that we might never have known. And we must thank Hiato Tokugawa for finding such a treasure hidden in a little bookshop in a forgotten street in San Francisco. Kiyoshi Hasada's introduction gently invites us to walk through the pages, as Lafcadio and Setsuko might have done as they travel together, experiencing Japan with respect and acceptance. Hasada's description of Hearn's study remaining as it had the last time he had left it, made me smile with little sadness. There is something quite touching in the way we choose to remember a loved one, as if there is some chance they might reappear and fill the lonely spaces in the house that emerge after death. I felt it rather important to give you some background of the author and his work, to understand something of the man behind those incredible tales of ancient Japan. But, before we hear about the story of Mimi Nashi Hoichi and Yuki Ona, First, I must explain one more thing. In very basic terms, I will attempt to describe kami, shinto, and ancestor worship, which is all important as they play a role in the stories of Kwaidan. Japan's traditional faith, based on the worship of kami, is known as shinto. The shinto kami are the spirits or phenomena that are worshipped in the religion of shinto. They are the elements in nature, including the sun, the moon, the wind, the rain, sea, rocks and trees, plants, animals, people, creationary forces in the universe, as well as the spirits of the deceased. The sun goddess, 
Amaterasu, is considered Shinto's most important kami. Many kami are considered the ancient ancestors of entire clans, and some ancestors became kami upon their death, if they were able to embody the values and virtues of kami in life. Traditionally, great leaders like an emperor could become a kami. Places in which the kami are worshipped are often known as jinja, or what we would call a shrine. Many people also have a kamidana, or a family shrine in their home, for in Japanese culture, ancestors can be viewed of as a form of kami. Shinto believes humans are fundamentally good, and evil is believed to be caused by evil spirits. As a result, the purpose of most of Shinto rituals is to keep away evil spirits by purification, prayers and offerings to the kami. Shinto and Buddhism are Japan's two major religions. Buddhism was imported from the mainland in the 6th century. Since then, the two religions have been coexisting relatively harmoniously. The following are general beliefs held by Japanese people regarding life after death, which persist to this day. For a time when people die, their spirits remain to wander near the place of their death. After that, they cross Sanzu no Kawa, the river of three crossings, to the next world and become Buddhas or Kami. If they have strong attachments to this world, or if they hold grudges, they cannot attain Buddhahood and instead become ghosts or yurai. People who have committed wicked deeds fall into hell as a punishment and are tormented by King Enma and his demons. The dead return to their homes at the time of the Summer Bon Festival and ancestors are given posthumous names which are inscribed on mortuary tablets. These tablets are placed on family altars with incense sticks which are burned. The story of Mimi Nashi Huichi. More than 700 years ago, at Danonura, in the streets of Shiminoseki, was fought the last battle of the long contest between Haiki, or the Taira clan, and the Genji, or Minamoto clan. There the Haiki perished utterly, with their women and children, and their infant emperor likewise, now remembered as Untokuteno and that sea and shore have been haunted for 700 years. Elsewhere I told you about the strange crabs found there, called Heike crabs, which have human faces on their backs, and are said to be the spirits of Heike warriors. But there are many strange things to be seen and heard along that coast. On dark nights, thousands of ghostly fires hover about the beach, or flit above the waves. Pale lights, which the fishermen called Onibi, or demon fires. And, whenever the winds are up, a sound of great shouting comes from the sea, like the clamour of battle. In former years, the Haike were very much more restless than they are now. They would rise about ships passing in the night, and would try to sink them. And at all times, they would watch for swimmers to pull them down. It was in order to appease those dead that the Buddhist temple, Amidaji, was built at Akamagasakai. A cemetery also was made close by, near the beach, and within it were set up monuments inscribed with the names of the drowned emperor and of his great vassals, and Buddhist services were regularly performed there, on behalf of the spirits of them. After the temple had been built, and the tombs were erected, the Heike gave less trouble than before, but they continued to do queer things at intervals, proving that they had not found the perfect peace. Some centuries ago, there lived at Akamagasakai a blind man named Hoichi, who was famed for his skill in recitation and in playing upon the biwa. From childhood, he had been trained to recite and to play, and while yet a lad he had surpassed his teachers. As a professional biwa hoshi, he became famous chiefly by his recitations of the history of the Heike and the Genji, and it is said that when he sang the song of the Battle of Danonura, even the goblins could not refrain from tears. At the outset of his career, Oichi was very poor, but he found a good friend to help him. The priest of the Amidaji was fond of poetry and music, and he often invited Oichi to the temple to play and recite. Afterwards, 
Being much impressed by the wonderful skill of the lad, the priest proposed that Huichi should make the temple his home, and this offer was gratefully accepted. Huichi was given a room in the temple building, and, in return for food and lodging, he was required only to gratify the priest with a musical performance on certain evenings, when otherwise disengaged. One summer night the priest was called away to perform a Buddhist service at the house of a dead parishioner, and he went there with his acolyte, leaving Hoichi alone in the temple. It was a hot night, and the blind man sought to kill himself on the veranda before his sleeping room. The veranda overlooked a small garden in the rear of the Amadaji. There, Hoichi waited for the priest's return, and tried to relieve his solitude by practising upon his biwa. But night passed, and the priest did not appear. But the atmosphere was still too warm for comfort within doors, and Hoichi remained outside. At last he heard steps approaching from the back gate. Somebody crossed the garden, advanced to the veranda, and halted immediately in front of him. But it was not the priest. A deep voice called the blind man's name, abruptly and unceremoniously, in the manner of a samurai summoning an inferior. Hoichi. Hoichi was too much startled for the moment to respond, and the voice called again, in a tone of harsh command. Hoichi. Hi, answered the blind man, frightened by the menace in the voice. I am blind. I cannot know who calls. There is nothing to fear, the stranger exclaimed, speaking more gently. I am stopping near this temple, and have been sent to you with a message. My present lord, a person of exceedingly high rank, is now staying in a Kamagasakai. He wished to know the scene of the Battle of Danonura, and today he visited that place. Having heard of your skill in reciting the story of the battle, he now desires to hear your performance. So you will take your biwa and come with me at once to the house where the August Assembly is waiting. In those times, the order of the samurai was not to be lightly disobeyed. Oichi donned his sandals, took his biwa, and went away with the stranger, who guided him deftly, but obliged him to walk very fast. The hand that guided was iron, and the clank of the warrior's stride proved him fully armed. Probably some place guard on duty. Oichi's first alarm was over. He began to imagine himself in good luck, for remembering the retainer's assurance about a person of exceedingly high rank, he thought that the lord who wished to hear the recitation could not be less than the daimo of the first class. Presently the samurai halted, and Huichi became aware that they had arrived at a large gateway, and he wondered, for he could not remember any large gate in that part of the town, except the main gate of the Amidaji. Kaimon, the samurai called, and there was a sound of unbarring, and the twain passed on. They traversed a space of a garden, and halted again before some entrance, and the retainer cried in a loud voice, Within here, I have brought Hoichi. Then came sounds of feet hurrying, and screens sliding, and rain doors opening, and voices of women in converse. By the language of the women, Hoichi knew them to be domestics in the noble household, but he could not imagine to what place he had been conducted. Little time was allowed him for conjecture, after he had been helped to mount several stone steps, upon the last of which he was told to leave his sandals, a woman's hand guided him along interminable reaches of a polished planking, and round pillared angles too many to remember, and over widths of amazing matted floor, into the middle of some vast apartment. There, he thought that many great people were assembled. The sound of rustling of silk was like the sound of leaves in a forest. He heard also a great humming of voices, talking in undertones, and the speech was the speech of courts. Hoichi was told to put himself at ease, and he found a kneeling cushion ready for him. After having taken his place upon it, and tuned his instrument, the voice of a woman, whom he divined to be the rojo, or matron in charge of the female service, addressed him, saying, It is now required that the history of the haiku be recited to the accompaniment of the biwa. Now the entire recital would have been required at the time of many nights, therefore Huichi ventured a question. 
as the whole of the story is not soon told. What portion is it a costly desired that I now recite? The woman's voice made answer. Recite the story of the battle at Danonura, for the pity of it is most deep. Then Hoichi lifted up his voice and chanted the chant of the fight on the bitter sea, wonderfully making his biwa to sound like the straining of oars and the rushing of ships, the whir and the hissing of arrows, the shouting and trampling of men, the crashing of steel upon helmets, the plunging of the slain in the flood. And to the left and right of him, in the pauses of his playing, he could hear voices murmuring praise. How marvellous an artist! Never in our own province was playing like this heard. Not in all the empires there another singer like Hoichi. Then fresh courage came to him, and he played and sang yet better than before, and a hush of wonder deepened about him. But when at last he came to tell the fate of the fair and helpless, the piteous perishing of the women and children, and the death leap of Nino Ama, with the imperial infant in her arms, then all the listeners uttered together one long, long, shuddering cry of anguish, and thereafter they wept and wailed so loudly and wildly that the blind man was frightened by the violence of the grief that he had made. For much time the sobbing and the wailing continued, but gradually the sounds of lamentation died away, and again, in the great stillness that followed, through which he heard the voice of the woman, whom he supposed to be Dorojo. She said, Although we had been assured that you were a very skilful player upon the biwa, and without an equal in recessitive, we did not know that anyone could be so skilful as you have proved yourself tonight. Our Lord has been pleased to say that he intends to bestow upon you a fitting reward, but he desires that you shall perform before him once every night for the next six nights, after which time he will probably make his August return journey. Tomorrow night, therefore, you are to come here at the same hour. The retainer who conducted you will be sent for you. There is another matter about which I have been ordered to inform you. It is required that you shall speak to no one of your visits here during the time of our Lord's August sojourn at Kamigasakai. As he is travelling incognito, he commands that no mention of these things be made. You are now free to go back to your temple. After Hoichi had duly expressed his thanks, a woman's hand conducted him to the entrance of the house, where the same retainer, who had guided him before, was waiting to take him home. The retainer led him to the veranda at the rear of the temple, and there bade him farewell. It was almost dawn when Hoichi returned, but his absence from the temple had not been observed, as the priest coming back at a very late hour had supposed him asleep. During the day, Hoichi was able to take some rest, and he said nothing about his strange adventure. In the middle of the following night, the samurai came for him again, and led him to the August Assembly, where he gave another recitation with the same success that had attended his previous performance. But during the second visit, his absence from the temple was accidentally discovered, and after his return in the morning, he was summoned to the presence of the priest, who said to him, in the tone of kindly reproach, We have been very anxious about you, friend Hoichi. To go out blind and alone at so late an hour is dangerous. Why did you go without telling us? I could have ordered a servant to accompany you. And where have you been? Oichi answered evasively. Pardon me, kind friend. I had to attend some private business. I could not arrange the matter at any other hour. The priest was surprised, rather than pained, by Hoichi's recitants. He felt it unnatural and suspected something was wrong. He feared that the blind lad had been bewitched or deluded by some evil spirits. He did not ask any more questions, but he privately instructed the men servants of the temple to keep watch upon Hoichi's movements, and to follow him in case he should again leave the temple after dark. On the very next night, Hoichi was seen to leave the temple, and the servants immediately lighted their lanterns and followed after him. But it was a rainy night and very dark, and before the temple folks could get to the roadway, 
Uichi had disappeared. Evidently, he had walked very fast. A strange thing, considering his blindness, for the road was in a bad condition. The men hurried through the streets, making inquiries at every house which Uichi was accustomed to visit. But nobody could give them any news of him. At last, as they were returning to the temple by the way of the shore, they were startled by the sound of a biwa furiously played in the cemetery of the Amadaji. Except for some ghostly fires, such as usually flitted there on dark nights, all was blackness in that direction. But the men at once hastened to the cemetery, and there, by the help of their lanterns, they discovered Oichi, sitting alone in the rain before the memorial tomb of Antokoteno, playing his bewaver sound, and loudly chanting the chant, the battle of Danonora. And behind him, and about him, and everywhere above the tombs, the fires of the dead were burning like candles. Never before had so great a host of Onibi appeared in the sight of a mortal man. Oichi-san, Oichi-san, the servants cried. You are bewitched, Oichi-san. But the blind man did not seem to hear. Strenuously he made his biwa to rattle and ring and clang. More and more wildly he chanted the chant, the battle of the Danonura. They caught hold of him. They shouted into his ear, Oichi-san, Oichi-san, come with us at once. Reprovingly, he spoke to them. To interrupt me in such a manner, before this great assembly, will not be tolerated. Whereat, in spite of the weirdness of the thing, the servants could not help laughing. Sure that he had been bewitched, they now seized him and pulled him upon his feet, and by main force hurried him back to the temple, where he was immediately relieved of his wet clothes by order of the priest, and reclad and made to eat and drink. Then the priest insisted upon a full explanation of his friend's astonishing behaviour. Oichi long hesitated to speak, but at last, finding that his conduct had really alarmed and angered the good priest, he decided to abandon his reserve, and he related everything that had happened from the time of the first visit of the samurai. The priest said, Oichi, my poor friend, you are now in great danger. How unfortunate that you did not tell me all this before. Your wonderful skill in music has indeed brought you into strange trouble. By this time you must be aware that you have not been visiting any house whatsoever, but have been passing your nights in the cemetery among the tombs of the Heike. And it was before the memorial tomb of the Antoko Tenno that our people tonight found you sitting in the rain. All that you have been imagining was an illusion. Except the calling of the dead. By once obeying them, you have put yourself in their power. If you obey them again, after what has already occurred, they will tear you in pieces. But they will have destroyed you sooner or later in any event. Now I shall not be able to remain with you tonight. I am called away to perform another service. But, before I go, it will be necessary to protect your body by writing holy texts upon it. Before sundown, the priest and his acolytes stripped Hoichi. Then, with their writing brushes, they traced upon his breast and back head and face and neck, limbs and hands and feet, even upon the soles of his feet and upon all parts of his body, the text of the Holy Sutra, called Hanya Shinkyo. When this had been done, the priest instructed Hoichi, saying, Tonight, as soon as I go away, you must seat yourself in the veranda and wait. You will be called, but whatever may happen, do not answer and do not move. Say nothing and sit still as if meditating. If you stir or make any noise, you will be torn asunder. Do not get frightened and do not think of calling for help because no help could save you. If you do exactly as I tell you, the danger will pass and you will have nothing more to fear. After dark, the priest and the acolyte went away and Hoichi seated himself on the veranda according to the instructions given to him. He laid his biwa on the planking beside him and, assuming the attitude of meditation, remained quite still, taking care not to cough or to breathe audibly. For hours he stayed thus. Then from the roadway he heard steps coming. They passed the gate, crossed the garden, approached the veranda, stopped, turned.
directly in front of him. Luigi, the deep voice called. But the blind man held his breath and sat motionless. Luigi, grimly called a voice a second time. Then a third time, savagely. Luigi. Luigi remained as still as stone, and the voice grumbled. No answer. That won't do. Must see where the fellow is. There was a noise of heavy feet mounting upon the veranda. The feet approached deliberately, halting beside him. Then, for long minutes, during which Hoichi felt his whole body shake to the beating of his heart, there was dead silence. At last, the gruff voice muttered close to him. Here's the Biwa. But of the Biwa player I see only two ears. So that explains why he did not answer. He had no mouth to answer with. There is nothing left of him but his ears. Now to my lord those ears I will take, in proof that the august commands have been obeyed, so far as possible. At that instant, Luigi felt his ears being gripped by fingers of iron and torn off. Great as the pain was, he gave no cry. The heavy footfalls receded along the veranda, descended into the garden, passed out to the roadway, ceased. From either side of his head, the blind man felt a thick, warm trickling, but he dared not lift his hands. Before sunrise, the priest came back. He hastened at once to the veranda in the rear, stepped and slipped upon something clammy, and uttered a cry of horror, for he saw, by the light of his lantern, that the clamminess was blood, but he perceived Hoichi sitting there, in the attitude of meditation, with the blood still oozing from his wounds. My poor Hoichi, cried the startled priest, what is this? You have been hurt. At the sound of his friend's voice, the blind man felt safe. He burst out sobbing and tearfully told his adventure of the night. Poor, poor Hoichi, the priest exclaimed. All my fault. My very grievous fault. Everywhere upon your body the holy texts had been written, except upon your ears. I trusted my acolyte to do that part of the work, and it was very, very wrong of me not to have made sure that he had done it. Well, the matter cannot now be helped. We can only try to heal your hurts as soon as possible. Cheer up, my friend. The danger is now well over. You will never again be troubled by those visitors. With the aid of a good doctor, Uichi soon recovered from his injuries. The story of his strange adventures spread far and wide, and soon made him famous. Many noble persons went to Akamagasakai to hear him recite, and large presents of money were given to him, so that he became a wealthy man. But from the time of his adventure, he was known only by the appellation of Mimi Nashi Hoichi. Hoichi, the earless. Yuki Ona In a village of the Musashi province, there lived two woodcutters, Musaku and Minokichi. At the time of which I am speaking, Musaku was an old man, and Minokichi, his apprentice, was a lad of eighteen years. Every day they went together to a forest situated about five miles from their village. On the way to that forest, there is a wide river to cross, and there is a ferry boat. Several times a bridge was built where the ferry is, but the bridge was each time carried away by a flood. No common bridge can resist the current there when the river rises. Musaku and Minokichi were on their way home one very cold evening when a great snowstorm overtook them. They reached the ferry and found that the boatman had gone away, leaving his boat on the other side of the river. It was no day for swimming, and the woodcutters took shelter in the ferryman's hut thinking themselves lucky to find any shelter at all. There was no brazier in the hut, nor any place in which to make a fire. It was only a two-mat hut with a single door, but no window. Masako and Minokichi fastened the door and lay down to rest, with their straw raincoats over them. 
At first they did not feel very cold, and they thought that the storm would soon be over. The old man almost immediately fell asleep, but the boy, Minokichi, lay awake a long time, listening to the awful wind and the continual slashing of snow against the door. The river was roaring, and the hut swayed and creaked like a junk at sea. It was a terrible storm, and the air was every moment becoming colder, and Minokichi shivered under his raincoat. But at last, in spite of the cold, he too fell asleep. He was awakened by a showering of snow in his face. The door of the hut had been forced open, and, by the snowlight, he saw a woman in the room, a woman all in white. She was bending above Musaku and blowing her breath upon him, and her breath was like a bright white smoke. Almost in the same moment she turned to Minokichi and stooped over him. He tried to cry out, but found that he could not utter any sound. The white woman bent down over him, lower and lower, until her face almost touched him and he saw that she was very beautiful, though her eyes made him afraid. For a little time, she continued to look at him. Then she smiled, and she whispered, I intended to treat you like the other man, but I cannot help feeling some pity for you, because you are so young. You are a pretty boy, Minokichi, and I will not hurt you now. But if you ever tell anybody even your own mother, about what you have seen this night. I shall know it, and then I will kill you. Remember what I say. With these words, she turned from him and passed through the doorway. Then he found himself able to move, and he sprang up and looked out. But the woman was nowhere to be seen, and the snow was driving furiously into the hut. Minokichi closed the door and secured it by fixing several billets of wood against it. He wondered if the wind had blown it open. He thought he might have only been dreaming, and he might have mistaken the gleam of the snow light in the doorway for the figure of a white woman. But he could not be sure. He called to Masaku and was frightened because the old man did not answer. He put out his hand in the dark and touched Masaku's face and found that it was ice. Musaku was stark and dead. By dawn the storm was over, and when the ferryman returned to his station a little after sunrise, he found Minokichi lying senseless beside the frozen body of Musaku. Minokichi was promptly cared for, and soon came to himself, but he remained a long time ill from the effects of the cold of that terrible night. He had been greatly frightened also by the old man's death but he said nothing about the vision of the woman in white. As soon as he got well again, he returned to his calling, going alone every morning to the forest and coming back at nightfall with bundles of wood, which his mother helped him to sell. One evening, in the winter of the following year, as he was on his way home, he overtook a girl who happened to be travelling by the same road. She was a tall, slim girl, very good-looking, and she answered Minokichi's greeting in a voice as pleasant to the ear as the voice of a songbird. Then he walked beside her, and they began to talk. The girl said her name was Oyuki, and that she had lately lost both of her parents, and that she was going to Yedo, where she happened to have some poor relations, who might help her to find a situation as a servant. Minokichi soon felt charmed by this strange girl, and the more that he looked at her, the handsomer she appeared to be. He asked her whether she was yet betrothed, and she answered, laughingly, that she was free. Then, in her turn, she asked Minokichi whether he was married or pledged to marry, and he told her that, although he had only a widowed mother to support, the question of an honourable daughter-in-law had not yet been considered as he was very young. After these confidences, they walked on for a long while without speaking, but, as the proverb declares, when the wish is there, the eyes can see as much as the mouth. By the time they reached the village, they had become very much pleased with one another, and then Minokichi asked Oyuki to rest a while at his house. After some shy hesitation, 
She went there with him, and his mother made her welcome and prepared a warm meal for her. Oyuki behaved so nicely that Minokichi's mother took a sudden fancy to her and persuaded her to delay her journey to Yedo. And the natural end of the matter was that Yuki never went to Yedo at all. She remained in the house as an honourable daughter-in-law. Oyuki proved to be a very good daughter-in-law. When Minokichi's mother came to die some five years later, her last words were of affection and praise for the wife of her son. And Oyuki bore Minokichi ten children, boys and girls, handsome children, all of them, with very fair skin. The country folk thought Oyuki a wonderful person, by nature different from themselves. Most of the peasant women age early, but Oyuki, even after her having become a mother of ten children, looked as young and as fresh as on the day when she had first come to the village. One night, after the children had gone to sleep, Oyuki was sewing by the light of a paper lamp, and Minokichi was watching her. He said, To see you sewing there, with the light upon your face, makes me think of a strange thing that happened when I was a lad of eighteen. I then saw somebody as beautiful and as white as you are now. Indeed, she was very like you. Without lifting her eyes from her work, Oyuki responded, Tell me about her. Where did you see her? Then Minokichi told her about the terrible night in the ferryman's hut, and about the white woman that had stooped above him, smiling and whispering, and about the silent death of old Musaku. And he said, Asleep or awake, it was the only time I saw a being as beautiful as you. Of course, she was not a human being, and I was afraid of her. Very much afraid. She was so white. Indeed, I have never been sure whether it was a dream that I saw, or the woman of the snow. Oyuki flung down her sewing and arose, and bowed above Minokichi where he sat, and shrieked into his face. It was I. I. Yuki it was. And I told you that I would kill you if you said one word about it. But for those children asleep there, I would kill you this moment. And now, you had better take very, very good care of them. For if ever they have reason to complain of you, I will treat you as you deserve. Even as she screamed, her voice became thin, like the crying of wind. Then she melted into a bright white mist that spired to the roof beams and shuddered away through the smoke hole. Never again was she seen. Once again, might I thank my wonderful Aunt Rikiko, Tuttle Publishing, Yuzuki, and of course, Lafcadio Heron. If anyone would like to win a copy of Kwaidan, please message me on Twitter at loremyth or email mlegendlore at gmail.com. I'll put all the names in a hat and draw them next week. I'll also include all the links in the show description. Thank you so much for joining me in celebrating Kwai Dan on Halloween. I do hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I'm Siobhan Clark, and this is the Myth, Legends and Lore podcast.